Great. Excellent. Welcome, all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, Nate, my name is Nasser Rahim, a senior climate resilience specialist at Westfall Group, and working with the town um, for the past several months on a flood vulnerability assessment for the James Brook watershed and um, developing resiliency strategies. Um, this is the second, or actually, it's kind of the third public forum. We had uh, one at the kickoff of the meeting, at the kickoff of the project back in November. Um, and another one where we discussed the results of the vulnerability assessment, that was, uh, I think two months ago. And so this is the final one. Um, this project is uh, uh, supported by a coastal zone management um, grant, coastal resiliency grant. And um, it runs through the end of this fiscal year, which is June 30th. So we are right around the end of, of the project, uh, at least this phase of the project. So we're here today to talk about um, the resilience strategies that we've been uh, developing and evaluating. So I just wanted to do a quick overview of the project again for folks who either forgot because <laughs> it's been a while or uh, for people that are joining for the first time. So the goals of the project there are four. The first is to develop an integrated flood model for the James Brook watershed that accounts for coastal, inland, and combined flooding hazards. This is a task that is um, sort of also being, well, Part of this, this uh, work is also being funded separately by the, through the town's own uh, resources and um, that work will continue through the summer. Um, but in the meantime, we have um, worked through the other goals here, assessing the vulnerability of public assets, that's things like facilities or infrastructure um, to present and future flooding, uh, developing strategies to reduce future flood risk specifically for critical wastewater infrastructure uh, as we know, the wastewater treatment plant and different infrastructure is located within the James Brook watershed. Um, <clears throat> the, the fourth strat, um, goal is to develop regional resiliency strategies to mitigate risks to these critical infrastructure and resources in the project area that are vulnerable. And regional strategies here doesn't mean, um, you know, something that Situate is doing with Cohasset and Ingham doesn't mean multi-jurisdictional. It just means that these are strategies that can be implemented in a smaller area that have benefits protecting a much larger area. Um, so the, the watershed study area is shown on the map on the right hand side here and uh, includes the um, parts of the historic town center, the Cohasset village, and portions of the waterfront as well as Jacob's Meadow and, and areas further upstream, the commuter rail tracks, et cetera. So um, as I mentioned, we've had a number of different meetings and stages of this project. We are currently nearing the end. And um, this meeting is again, focused on the regional resiliency options that we've developed. Uh, and we'll start off with a brief recap of the vulnerability assessment for folks who did not join the last one. Um, so the vulnerability assessment was focused on uh, overland coastal flooding, uh, which includes high tides, storm surge, and waves. And um, once this uh, integrated flood risk model that accounts for the inland flooding risks, as we know, James Brook, a lot of water that can come down and doesn't have a lot of places to go, has to all go through some small culverts, and so it can back up and cause flooding from rainfall upstream. And that particularly happens when there are high tides uh, or storm surge events. And so we're going to be updating kind of some of this information as that uh, new modeling results come out. Um, in terms of assets, we're really focused on critical infrastructure, facilities, and associated services. So these are largely public assets, but also other privately or nonprofit um, facilities that are were highlighted in the town's hazard mitigation plan, which is the plan that's required by FEMA to assess your community's hazards to different kinds of Sorry, vulnerabilities to a lot of different kinds of hazards and complex solutions to deal with them. Um, but the regional resiliency strategies we'll be discussing today do not just benefit those critical infrastructure assets, they also benefit private, private homes, businesses, et cetera. So we'll talk about some of that a little bit later. And then the geography, we're really focused here on the James Brook watershed, which was shown in that previous map, and, and especially focused on the area around Jacobs Meadow and Cohasset Village. Um, there are other waterfront areas at risk in town. Uh, including very nearby in Cohasset Cove um, and elsewhere in the region um, that require attention, but this is really the 
we're taking the first bite out of the the um, pie with this project here. Uh, to evaluate the flood risks um, that are that were to, to conduct this vulnerability assessment, we, we relied on data um, in the Massachusetts Coast Flood Risk Model, which was a group developed with MassDOT, Coastal Zone Management, and a variety of other um, agencies and um, academic partners. Uh, it includes it's a it's a hydrodynamic model, so it's not um, just the bathtub model where we take the elevation of high tide today and add a certain amount of storm surge and that's the water level everywhere. It's a dynamic uh, model, so it accounts for the elevations, the landscape, uh, it includes sea level rise. And sea level rise is modeled dynamically um, in different time horizons, 2030, 2050, 2070. Um, it includes different kinds of storms, so not just nor'east, not just tropical storms, which is more typical for a lot of uh, flood risk modeling, but also nor'easters, extra tropical storms, um, which we experience much more frequently and more, are more impactful in this region. And uh, so those inputs are put into this probabilistic hydrodynamic model. Thousands of different storms are run, at low tide, high tide, mid tide. Um, and then all those uh, results are analyzed statistically to uh, estimate the probability of flooding across landscapes across the entire Massachusetts coast, including Coriacea. And also you can um, evaluate flood depths, you can look at the duration of flooding, uh, you can identify flood pathways, and what we use this model for here in, in this phase of the project also is we can plug in different adaptations, say raise a road here or um, put some sort of flood barrier here, and then rerun the model uh, for a particular storm, not for the thousands of storms we ran to develop the probability analysis, but just for a few representative storms to evaluate what's the effect of those adaptations. Are they, do they totally solve the problem? Are there missing links? Um, if we do something first and not the other thing, is there some marginal benefit or is there no, no benefit at all? So we can analyze all those types of questions uh, using the model. We can also evaluate, do, does putting up a barrier here um, make flooding worse on the, on the waterward side, right? So are we harming neighboring property owners or infrastructure by putting some kind of flood barrier here? So we've conducted that analysis as part of this project. Um, I said I was going to go through this introductory material quickly. I'm, I'm realizing I'm doing it at my normal pace here. Uh, the, the model includes um, data for present day, 2030, 2050, and 2070. And those future time horizons incorporate sea level rise. Uh, the amounts shown here, so 1.3 feet, 2.5 feet, 4.3 feet. And those are based on the high um, sea level rise curve that the state has developed. It's a probabilistic curve, so it accounts for what's the likelihood of ice sheets melting to a certain degree, and oceans expanding because of heat, et cetera. Um, the high curve was chosen because it has a very low likelihood of being exceeded. So what I'm going to show you, there's a very, very low chance that things will be worse than what I'm showing you, right? When I show you these flood maps, there's a very low chance that things will be worse. There's a, there's a chance that things could be better, which is good. And as we observe sea level rise over time, we can adjust our sense of when do these 2030 maps represent, right? If, if we're actually following a slower sea level rise curve, we can say, well, you know, maybe it's the 2040, um, you know, time horizon, or maybe it's the 2050 time horizon. Um, and as we compare these, these estimates, these amounts of sea level rise um, to an intermediate um, sea level rise curve, so we go high and other ones in between those and an intermediate one, um, there's, a, there's about 20 to 30 Foot uh, potential or 20 to 30 foot, 20 to 30 year gap. So 20 to 30 results here, if we follow more of an intermediate sea level rise curve, could be more like 2050. 2050 could be more like 2070, 2070 could be more like 2100. So when I, when I say 2030, I'm talking about these numbers here, these time horizons here, but keep in mind that when I say 2030, it could be 2030 to 2050, depending on how fast sea level rises. Um, and as you look, this little black line here shows the um, actual observed sea level rise. And so, um, like through 2010, we felt like we were pretty. We felt like we were really following the high curve, right? You can see it's very close to that top blue line. And then over time, in the in the last 10 years, 2010 to 2020, we started actually going below the intermediate curve. So sea level rise is not um, yeah, sea level is not just like a perfectly um, 
you know, straight uh, line that follows, you know, bumps and jumps, as you can see historically. And so we expect that to continue. Currently, we're well below these high projections, but that doesn't mean that there could be a short term jump in those projections in, in observed sea level rise. So we could be experiencing some periods of higher sea levels and, and some periods of lower sea levels. Uh, this is the resolution of the, the model. Um, each of those dots is where there's data about sort of stuff on the ground. Um, the, the, as water is pushed through this model mesh from storms, as wind and all these different things, each of those nodes is, there's calculations happening between each of those nodes. That's the hydrodynamic aspect of this. So it's very high resolution for a statewide model, but it's still not down to like the foot. Foot difference, right? So, um, <clears throat> depending on where those nodes fall, there might be some different interpolation, you know, differences between what would actually happen or uh, and what we we're showing here. But we're pretty um, pleased with how high of resolution this is. This is a deeper dive into um, the Jacobs Meadow area. And as I mentioned, you know, there's important drainage infrastructure here that connects sort of water that would normally flow down. Um, downstream towards uh, Cohasset Cove. Those are those yellow lines. Those, those infrastructure are not included in the MCFRM model. Okay, so that's why we're developing this other model to really account for the town's infrastructure and be able to uh, analyze, you know, if there's flooding in Jacobs Meadow, would it actually backflow um, into Smith's, uh, like up to Smith's place, Smith place, for example. Like would it flow upstream and instead of downstream? Um, so when I show you these next set of maps, they're, they're really showing the overland flooding mix. They're not showing additional flooding that could come from underground. So, um, so just keep in mind that everything kind of left of South Main Street, you know, could be worse than what we're showing it. Um, so this is the present day uh, annual probability of flooding. You can see in the top right corner, there's a, a scale there. The, um, the darker, the sort of like medium green, apple green is, is the 2% annual chance risk. That's a, what, a 50 year recurrence event. So when someone says, oh, it's a, it was a hundred year storm, it was a thousand year storm, that represents a 50 year storm. So in a 50 year storm or 2% event uh, in present day, Jacobs Meadow could be flooding um, with water coming from the Gulf over Summer Street and into um, Jacobs Meadow. Uh, in a more extreme event, water could come across the waterfront, which is where people probably think it would come over, which is um, on Border Street, between Elm Street and Border Street. Um, in 2030, you can see that that probability of that particular event changes to uh, 20%. So 20% is a, is a five year return period, right? So we went from 50 year to a five year. That's like an order of magnitude increase in frequency. Um, and of course, you know, the higher uh, probability events like a, a 5% or a 1% event, 100 year storm, you know, in, increase in terms of the area of impact. And in 2050, you can see the probability increases to 50%, which is, um, or rather, <clears throat> sorry, this is a, no, 100%. So annually in 2070, in 2050 rather. So this is a kind of a big tipping point, right? If flooding is happening in this, in this scale annually, I'm not showing you all where all the buildings are because I don't want people to start looking for their house or their, their neighbor's house, but there are houses there, there are, there's infrastructure in, in those flood areas. And so 2050 represents kind of a tipping point. It's a lot of water. It could, it could be 2050, it could be 2070, but it's, it's sort of you know, what we can expect in the long range future. Um, and when we look, this map is actually showing the depth of flooding in a 1% chance annual event in 2050. That's like the 100 year storm in 2050. Um, you can see like the dark blue color there is, uh, <clears throat> is over 10 feet. So, you know, you have, over, you have five feet of flooding or more on uh, Summer Street in some places, on South Main Street, again, more than five feet, possibly <clears throat> than that. So really significant flood deaths. What does that mean? Um, this kind of gives you a scale of like, what do those colors mean? You know, so pretty significant flooding, um, both for infrastructure and for private property. 
Uh, what does this mean for kind of the assets at risk that we evaluated? Well, I've got a more detailed presentation else, uh, elsewhere, but just to uh, talk about a few of the assets of the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, so that the red color here is, is our, our assets that are impacted in a 10% annual chance event in 2050. So that's a 10 year event. And the orange ones are the 1%. So just look at the orange and the red here to capture all the things that would be flooded in a 1% storm in 2050. There's the MBTA Greenbush line, there's uh, Summer Street, Elm Street, Border Street, Margin Street, South Main, uh, Spring Street. You've got uh, access to the wastewater treatment plant, the influent pump station, uh, Red Lion Inn, which is, is uh, could be used for housing after a disaster, the food pantry, St. Anthony's, and, um, and the United States Post Office. So, and you can see with the orange that's in, um, the uh, Cohasset Village area, that Cohasset Village is nothing, is being flooded in this scenario from, um, from, from the trouble and the ground. We did a, a deeper dive into the wastewater um, system that the town owns, the wastewater infrastructure that's here, it's particularly like the most critical stuff. It's sitting, you know, the wastewater treatment plant sitting out there in Jacobs Meadow. It looks like a dicey place to have such an important piece of infrastructure when it's in a floodplain. Turns out that uh, a lot of the, the infrastructure there is relatively elevated. Um, even if the bottom of the building is, you know, at ground and the ground is pretty low, the way to get in there, so water would have to kind of go up and through the front door. And the front door might be, you know, four feet above the ground. So, um, or in the case of the treatment plant, when you go inside, a lot of the tanks, a lot of the pumps and everything are, are not sitting right on the ground, but are a little bit above the ground. And so, um, we see kind of an um, increase in vulnerability over time, but you can kind of see this tipping point for major impacts around that 2051 percent um, event, where you've lost access, you've know, got a ton of water coming in through manholes out there that are underwater, you've got lost your power because your transformer is underwater, your emergency power, your emergency generator is underwater, so you can't even have backup power, your treatment plant is flooded, so all your processes are, are damaged. And your wastewater uh, and your influent pump station is uh, is overflowing, which means sewage is coming out of that facility, right? Stuff that would be sitting in a well underground is now mixing with surface water. So that's a catastrophe. Um, but in other communities that I've worked in, that kind of scenario shows up way sooner in in more um, in less extreme events. So relative to other communities, this was like a a good a good finding for me here. Um, yeah, right. 2050 is, is quite a ways out, so that's good. And then uh, just to show 2070, um, you know, there's a very high, uh, there's a very large area that's uh, vulnerable to annual flooding. Um, if I was, you know, looking just at high, uh, just high tide, daily high tide, a lot of these areas would be flooding at daily high tide. Um, so, that's a long ways out, but there are uh, risks on the long-term horizon that uh, need to be addressed. So uh, now, you know, we've understood our we've understood our vulnerabilities. We're trying to figure out, well, what do we do to mitigate those, to re reduce those risks? Uh, what kinds of actions can we take now, and how adaptable are those actions to the need to maybe even adapt further in the future? Um, so we started to look at these flood, these major flood pathways. So this is kind of like, where does water come from that floods all this, this area, this infrastructure? Uh, well, uh, number one here is the first thing, the first place where water crosses um, you know, into the watershed from the coast. It's actually coming from the Gulf in this case. Um, the second place, it's marginally different in elevation. They're pretty close to each other, uh, is um, between Elm Street and Border Street right on the waterfront. And then there's also another flood pathway over um, Summer Street and South Main Street, number three that's shown here. So number one and three both come from the Gulf. Number two comes straight from Cohasset Village. Uh, and you can see in 2050, the probability of these things activating is really high. So, um, so we set our sights on 2050, that 1% level and said, um, you know, what kinds of solutions can we come up with that are technically feasible that will protect the community from that level of risk, which means if we're able to do that, we've bought down a whole bunch of risk in the near term, in the present day, in 2030s, et cetera. 
Um, and even in 2050, right? Even a 1% annual chance event in 2050 is still a rare event. It's still an unlikely thing to happen. But so it's a, it's a really robust level of protection. But we know that that's not the end of the story, right? Even if, if um, you know, sea level will continue to rise and so there will be a need for, for more action in the future. So that's my short version of the introduction, the <laughs> vulnerability assessment summary. Uh, we did a, a meeting, a public meeting about this. It's recorded presentations online. We also have a vulnerability assessment report. Um, all the documentation, et cetera, is available on the town's website. And it's shown. Um, so before I move on to the resiliency strategies, uh, I was wondering if there are any questions or comments. If you're already online, or, I'm not sure if we can check on the um, In the room? Yes. Sure, I'm interested in the uh, one, two, and three. And actually, one and three. So the water, the vulnerability of uh, the biggest vulnerability we have is water going up the Gulf River, and then and then coming down. I, I, I get where it comes down Black Horse Lane, but how does it get over to Summer Street and South Main? Have through Black Horse Lane and then through another route. I can uh, I jump back on. So I guess there's some yeah some high points. That you can see like there's kind of a around. cross. There's a crossing here at Black Horse Lane that comes across. It comes basically flows over Black Horse Lane and then across some lowlands and wetlands. So okay. residences. So there's marsh and backyard there that yeah. um, that it just goes right through. <laughs> yeah, and here it crosses over like West Cape Lane. Uh, so it's kind of in, in both cases going through this relatively narrow gap. Right? And then I guess crossing Summer Street. Summer Street's not raised there, so it just goes racing. Right across through the through the residential houses there and get Jenkins met up. Yeah, right here it's very low, the lowest point um, along these kind of this ring of, of uh, roads around Jacobs Meadow, and then over here it's actually fairly high, but it's kind of still the third place. If you just addressed one and two, that would still be a vulnerability. Water would still go over there um, at some higher water level. And I, I guess in hypothetical reasons, but if you, I know that, you know, in the town, we've often looked at Cohasset Cove during super high tides and storms. And I don't know that we really observe water flowing underneath the Border Street Bridge and going back. Do you have actual readings from high storm, high water events <laughs> showing water flowing that direction? We don't, but there's a photo um, from the coastal school. Um, that I showed in the previous meeting that showed Black Horse Lane in the March mm -hmm. 3rd or March 2nd, 2018 storm, and it was like underwater. So clearly that, that sort of level, that kind of tipping point is, is, is close to being reached in that event. Okay. Um, and it, it depends on what kind of storm it is, right? So if tropical storms come through very quickly, um, they have a hard time maybe pushing all that water through to the Gulf, right? Because it's a pretty narrow, yeah. you know, um, opening, you know, for all that volume to get through. But it's nor'easters that hang around for a little while, develop a little, you know, stick around for a little while that that um, can push that water through there. And because we're more exposed to nor'easters here, that tends to dominate um, some of the flood risk that we see. Interesting. Okay. Yes. In terms of uh, storm tide pathways, is <clears throat> Excuse me, Margin Street, is that out of the study area? Yeah. Because my question would be at what scenario with that flood risk model would the storm tide pathway at Margin Street start to impact on flooding change in the watershed? Yeah, so it's interesting because, uh, you know, having seen the photos and the study, the storm tide pathway study, you know, when I started this project, I assumed those were interconnected, but they're really not. Because there's kind of this high ground on Margin Street right, um, right here. Right. There's kind of like this dividing line between water that would go up Margin Court or go around, um, I forget what the other road is, uh, a little bit further up on Margin Street. Um, so that water kind of is kind of in a separate floodplain, essentially. So there's not, unless maybe going through the drainage system or something like that, it's not really circumventing through this area. And um, and I, I've looked briefly at that. It's not the focus. I'm really focused on this area here, but um, 
And it seems like that floodplain is sort of complex and pretty like interconnected and large. Like there's a lot of places like from Atlantic down to margin where there's like to patch it up like this to deal with these flood pathways here would require a bunch more interventions, I think, than just kind of just doing something on Margin Street itself. You could raise Margin Street and improve access to some houses, but like the flooding might come around Margin Court, you know, from through someone else's backyard from a different direction. But um, I totally recognize that that's like the first place that floods and people know it floods and it's a problem. Um, we didn't really dive into what the solutions would be. I guess that in an earlier meeting, the emergency response groups identified that they'd be cut off from getting to that part of town with their cars and vehicles. But that still, that's its own problem, separate from a sewer treatment plant getting inundated, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if, if this intersection, you know, if the intersection of Elm and Margin and, you know, and uh, Summer Street is all flooded, then they're not gonna be able to even get there, that. even if it was raised, right? So there's kind of like, this, with transportation, there's a need for a lot of things. <laughs> Um, both operational and infrastructural to solve them. Like my community, I live out in Swantum and Quincy, and we're basically on an island connected by a causeway. Now, when 2018, that causeway flooded twice, and again in December of last year, you know, we were told to cut off, like you couldn't leave or get onto the island. So we have a fire station on the island, and they pre staged some, I think the first one, kind of the first one in January of 2018, caught them off guard, but by the time the March one came around, um, they have pre-staged vehicles, like high water vehicles that can drive through deep water. You know, those kind of looking like the Army National Guard type vehicles with the, you know, snorkels on them. Mm -hmm. So they had pre-staged some of those assets there, pre-staged an ambulance, and they had their fire trucks and kind of were, and police cars and stuff. So they were kind of operationally ready to respond to things, uh, even though they knew they'd have to wait for the tide to recede before they, you know, took somebody to the hospital or something like that. They probably took them. So, um, yeah, it's not a great solution, but it's better than being totally cut off from services. Any other questions? Any questions online? I think some people on YouTube themselves or they want to uh, submit your comments and questions in writing to Cassandra. No, no chat. Respond. We do have a chat. We can't um, sign on YouTube chat and we can use other issues. So any gotcha. questions that come in the Q&A, let us Okay, great. Yeah, we'll come back to the questions. Please keep answering them and don't leave. All right. So the regional resiliency strategies. So we developed um, I don't know how many, a bunch of regional resiliency strategies, different alternatives, different options. Um, we developed and evaluated them for feasibility. So we wanted to make sure that what we were proposing or were considering here was technically feasible. We want to also um, try to design them. At a these are all conceptual, so they're not like really highly detailed engineering, but we want to kind of design the concepts to avoid or minimize impacts to salt marsh, because that's a really big um, permitting hurdle and also just not good to go around destroying salt marshes. They do a lot of things for the environment, including pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it, um, and also avoiding private property impacts to the extent possible, um, to the extent feasible as well. So that was our, those were kind of our shining lights. It should be technically feasible. It should be, uh, you know, minimize impacts to salt marsh, minimize impacts to private property. Um, we are generally targeting to mitigate that 2051% um, annual chance flood level, which is about um, elevation 11.8 or to 12 feet in NADD 88 datum. So that's particular, but I'll show you some graphics that, that kind of depict that more understandably for people who don't look at datum sheets and elevations all day, like I do. Uh, we consider the adaptability. So, you know, can these strategies, each of these strategies be adapted to either be raised further in the future if needed to deal with uh, longer term um, increasing risks? We estimated the order of magnitude construction costs. Um, there are, uh, we did that based on, you know, rel rel um, readily available information, the estimated quantities of different things, like how many linear feet of seawall, how many, Feet, uh, how many cubic yards of fill would we need for this roadway? All kinds of different things we tried to, to account for. We did not account for some, some things, design, permitting, um, contractor mobilization, even utilities. There's like you know, natural gas, water, you know, there's all different kinds of things buried under roadways, for example. Um, 
real estate. So in the event that there are private impacts that aren't just like, can I just adjust your driveway? You know, there could be real estate impacts and then site control. So, you know, just mobilization, permitting design that could add like 15% to these costs. Um, utilities could, you know, be extra hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when you look at these numbers, don't, don't say few too fast. They're likely to be higher in, in reality, but we did the best we could with kind of um, keeping it relatively narrow. And then um, we evaluated their effectiveness. So we, we took this MCFRM model. We um, took some representative coastal storms. We ran them through the model with kind of not, no change in what's there, so no action. And we ran them again after adjusting the elevations of land to account for barriers that we might be um, considering, and then said, okay, did it, did it work? Did it not work? Uh, did it have any negative impacts on people on the unprotected side or infrastructure or houses and things like that on the unprotected side of the barrier? Um, and we also considered whether they would uh, be separately vulnerable to tidal flow. What I mean by that is um, sometimes you have a road and underneath that road is a culvert, right? And that's letting water, tidal, tide, the tide goes in, maybe um, wets some salt marsh area and then tide goes out. Um, these, uh, these outfalls can be, um, these culverts can be retrofitted with tide gates. Um, the cheaper solution is to retrofit them with like sort of like a manual tide gate maybe, and that requires somebody to go out and shut the gate. Um, you would only do that for a storm, right? So you know a storm's coming, you go out there, you shut the gate. Um, so when high tides become really high and cause a lot of flooding, that system no longer kind of works right. Now you can design tide, tide gates to be different to allow only so much water in to get the salt marsh wet and not flood everybody out. That's what that's what's done currently in Jacob's Meadow, right? The culvert, the James Brook culvert that goes out to Grassy Cove only lets in so much water and then it's has an automated gate that closes once it, the water gets to a certain point so that backyards don't flood, or I should say buildings <laughs> don't flood. Maybe some backyards flood a little bit. Um, but it's not, you know, so so um, creating a lot of nuisance flooding for people. So that's the that's the approach we took uh, when developing these options. And I mentioned eleven point eight is kind of our one point eight to twelve feet is our target number. That's true, except for uh, right along the, the waterfront where we have to also consider waves. So um, right in front of Coasi Cove, we we targeted thirteen elevation thirteen, which includes uh, the you know. Would mitigate some, not all possible waves, but would direct, um, mitigate a lot of the spray over that happens, you know, when waves hit sea walls. And the idea there is to minimize, um, you know, damage or flooding to the roadways and also property that might be on the water. So this is kind of just a different view without all the flooding of the existing landscape. The white lines indicate these flood pathways. Uh, so we're going to go kind of box by box um, through some different alternatives. But generally, number one is from, from Elm Street uh, to Warrior Street there. Uh, we had two options there, one where the road is raised, one where you're raising the waterfront. Um, then we're going to move to two, which is kind of the main stretch of Summer Street. Um, there we looked at like what is a short term intervention, maybe like a very small footprint inter uh, intervention that could be done to mitigate some near term risks. And then we looked at the big picture, longer term, what do we need to do? So it's basically it's a kind of a road raising wall combination of, of strategies there. Then we said, okay, well, um, it's actually the idea to do this <laughs> came from our last meeting where someone said, well, uh, you know, there's a private road next to Black Horse Lane. It seems like all the water is funneling through there. We had previously been kind of like, well, it's private, so we should probably stay away from it. But we said, okay, let's do it. So we looked at some different alternatives to block the flood pathway a little bit further well, downstream, upstream, depends on how you think about it, whatever, closer to the source. Uh, which would protect the, an, uh, the area between Summer Street and Blackboard and, uh, mm -hmm. and Westgate Lane. And then finally, we looked at um, number four, which is at the, the mouth of the Gulf River. Um, and there's a couple of different places, different culverts and uh, areas where the water would come through, but the main passageway is under the bridge. And so we looked at a strategy there, which involves some walls, some road raising, and um, a big Tidal control structure, like really big and very expensive. 
So uh, <clears throat> that last one, I'll jump ahead and say that um, we were uh, concerned that like actually water could come from situate instead, right, on the Gulf, because the Gulf goes down to the, there's a pond, Jason was standing upon, it's Squatch Street, Squatch Street. And there's a cobble berm there and, and a row of houses right on the barrier beach. And um, when we looked actually at the storms that we ran here, uh, both kind of a little bit larger than our design storm and a little bit smaller than our design storm, neither of them kind of overtopped that berm. Now that berm on the waterfront could erode, right? Our model's not accounting for the dynamics of erosion, so it could erode and now you've got a breach in that system and now water is coming up, but that's not included in the model. So in our case, water wasn't coming from that direction. Water was all coming from the mouth and it's obviously enough to um, flood all these areas. So uh, we felt pretty good about that as part of the solution. And then the other part would probably need to be you know, supporting situate, you know, with maintaining that infrastructure there. Yes. Quick question about Gant Road before you get up to Mr. Washington. Yeah. I have no idea what the elevation is in relationship to everything that you've studied or that um, what the impact of flooding might be in North Situate, especially at Gannett, as it would essentially choke the Gulf River and create more push in the Cohasset direction because there's no place for the water to go. Can't get up to the splash yet, whether the berm gets breached like you were talking about or not. I yeah. don't know the um, elevation at Gannett. I'm just wondering if you guys looked at that and what its impact on. We did, yeah, actually. The downstream would, would be. Yeah, we, we should have done our, our, our homework and looked at that cobble berm issue first, because when we looked at the flood model, took a step back and looked at the flood models after we'd already come up with this great strategy for this location, <laughs> we were like, wait a second, water is probably coming from the other direction. We, we assumed it's gonna be, you know, because at Gantt Road in our flood, the flood maps, there's like a wide area that's completely flooded. So, you know, we were like, okay, tons of water's gonna come down there. So we said, you know, we put into the model, let's block Gannett Road, we'll raise that as some kind of dike structure, with some tide gates or something like that. And there's another little pathway around it. We did that, we ran it and we were like, oh, Nothing changed. Why is that? Oh, it didn't actually come over from that side. It was all still coming from the Gulf. So, Gannett Road in this scenario, in, in the in the maps I've shown you so far, and they're um, they're not. If the data is not available yet, we will make it available somehow. We um, we have the data that can show you that all these different. Actually, you can see it online now. Um, Coastal Zone Management has a website where you can go and look at these MCFRM maps and see not just in Cohasset, but statewide, you know, where the probabilities of flooding, how deep is the water, et cetera. And that Gannett Road area is, is quite vulnerable um, from this uh, pump, from this source of flooding. So if we were to mitigate that, we would mitigate a bunch of risk at Gannett Road. All right, so I'm gonna go through these um, options <laughs> and there's a lot of material here. So uh, I'm sorry. And also <laughs> feel free to stop me and ask questions. I'm gonna give you some like wayfinding right now. Um, so for each of the strategies, or for each of these areas, this is area one. Um, we have kind of either you know one, two, or three different plans. These are kind of looking at it from, from the sky like a like a bird. Uh, and we're showing these different interventions. We have these different uh, la labels saying kind of what would happen where. And then these areas, these two red lines that I've shown here. These are areas where we've created like a, a cross section. So, uh, so A, 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 and then over here, B, B. So later on, I'll show you some graphics that show you if you're at street level and you're looking at this like sliced in half, you know, what does this intervention look like? So you get a sense of the physical scale of these strategies. So there's a plan view and there's one, two or three different cross sections that will show you kind of from a different view what this looks like. Um, so in this um, <clears throat> example here, so this is to raise the road to elevation 11.8. So <clears throat> basically um, to raise the road and minimize impacts to uh, private properties that are adjacent. And there are still some that we were not able to kind of using this high level <coughs> design, conceptual design level mitigate. Maybe it could be mitigated through, through actual design, but um, some private property impacts here, but 
but they're kind of small in scale. Um, to do this, we need to raise the road up and the road becomes a little bit narrower than it currently is um, through this section. So then we're, we're tying into high ground on Margin and we're tying into high ground on Border Street. Or rather, we're, we're, <laughs> we're getting to a point, we're getting to a high level on Border Street and then we're going back down to Border Street. So Border Street's pretty low along that whole waterfront on the Captain's Locket section. So we're kind of right where that BB is would be kind of like the top you'd be sitting kind of at this at this 11.8 elevation and then from there you're going to go down to meet the existing grade um, of border street and you can which see is, which would be like three feet lower uh probably about that yeah oh, we can see in a second okay yeah uh <clears throat> the other alternative that we looked at was to raise the seawall to elevation 13. so that that higher one to kind of mitigate those wave impacts and um, there's different ways to increase seawall heights. You can do it like with granite block walls, like you might have existing granite block walls, you can build those up, you can reinforce their, their structure. You gotta excavate a lot to do that. Uh, in some places you can drive sheet pile, which looks kind of industrial and not necessarily the most historic nice thing to look at, but it's very functional, it lasts a long time, quite expensive. And then I think you can do that sort of in between is, is do concrete walls. And there are ways to fancy them up so they don't look like concrete walls, but they look a lot more like stone blocks. So um, the existing ones you have out there are kind of a mix of concrete on the top and then on the bottom they're granite stone blocks. So we, we show some strategies, a particular way with the seawalls here in these different graphics, but there's some, there's a lot of flexibility once you get into actual design. Um, in, in both of these cases, or rather in this, actually in both of these cases, I perhaps mentioned that the tide, there's a tidal control structure at the end of the um, uh, out at the outfall of the James Brook culvert. So the James Brook culvert goes under the road and then goes into this, this kind of interesting little structure that has a tie gate on it. On the top of that structure, it's actually like a metal grate, so you can stand on it. And that means that if water is, is higher than the walls of that structure, it's going to go into that grate and just circumvent that tie gate that's supposed to be closed when there's a big storm. So it also, these strategies also involve raising that, that top of that structure so that it can be, um, so that that doesn't happen. And in this case, because we don't want water to go around the seawall and flood this area anyways, we also have to add that little road cable. So adding a kind of a hump in the street, similar to what you have already on the margin street side. And, and all these properties, the buildings themselves on the landward side of Border Street are all up relatively high. So it's not um, directly impacting those houses or anything like that but there may be some regrading around driveways, et cetera, which we'll show. So this is kind of on the bottom here, this shows the full AA section all the way from the tide gate structure out there to the uh, to the Jacob's Meadow. Uh, on top, we're focusing just on that road section. So this is what the existing elevation of the road is, and this is what the uh, raised road option would look like. So there's still some space for parallel parking. We show these as grassy side slopes, but you can see that in the existing conditions, you have kind of this angled parking. So there could be sections of it that are paved if that's needed. Um, and so there's kind of a, uh, you might have a better view from up there um, <laughs> as a pedestrian, but you still have those pedestrian facilities, but it would be tighter. Uh, and as we go to the waterfront, you know, we have shown here as a, a concrete wall, but it could take various different forms. But we've also, what we've done here to mitigate kind of the impact of views if you're walking along the side of that seawall or at Veterans Park is to say, well, we can also raise land um, just inward of that so that you're not physically, so, you know, your head's not below the seawall. Um, that might be harder for the kids or people in wheelchairs, you know, who are, um, don't have as high a view um, level to see over that. But we've tried to mitigate that and it can be done, you know, to a greater extent. And then those are the wall. Um, extend the wall extensions on the top, tie gate off wall. And then on Border Street, this is that BB section. This is uh, the existing condition. So it looks like the existing ground is at like nine here, maybe eight at the waterfront. <clears throat> um, it goes as low as like seven in some places, uh, across from the uh, is it Lobster Town? What's the other town? Um, I'm trying to say it's Lobster Town. There is a Lobster Town. Lobster this, town. This yeah. is across from there. I'm saying it, it gets lower. Border Street gets lower. Oh, certainly. Okay. 
So this is um, raising to elevation 11.8, and then for 13, you have basically a higher sidewalk with a higher wall in the right So how, how long of a stretch of water would you anticipate that rise It's only as shown here. Uh, you, you could, um, the reason we kind of stopped there, because we, we recognize this doesn't really solve border street to us, right? And, and the residences that would be cut off in, the, in those kinds of events. The reason we got stuck here is because on the waterward side, we have these, uh, a lot of these businesses, there's not a lot of space to negotiate a big change in grade of the roadway. Like to get from the roadway to the business down here and the parking and stuff like that, like you can't just like put a, shove a driveway in there, or put like a big slanted paved area, you know, that would send a lot of storm water, for example, up into those buildings. So we're kind of a little bit stuck there. And because it's outside of our watershed, so I said, we'll deal with that later. A question where you have the, the B line yeah. there and you have some grass sloping that's sloping toward the private residence, right? Yeah. What happens to water that goes there, uh, whether it's rainwater or otherwise? Does it flood their, their yard? And um, so yeah, the, like the, the buildings are still set back pretty far from mm -hmm. kind of where those connections would be made. So I don't perceive any. Um, risk to the buildings themselves from uh, additional stormwater that might flow off that um, side swale. It's a grassy side swale, so it shouldn't be, you know, it's a little bit pervious. Um, uh, we didn't design drainage systems too, so if that was a, something that needed to be solved with, with infrastructure, it could be put in eventually. Does this solution require sheet pile or concrete wall? Um, not necessarily. Um, you can see that we've also shown some salt marsh uh, close to the edge there. Yeah. So there, there are trade-offs with doing things different ways. First of all, the bedrock could be pretty high in the section, so I'm not sure how sheet pile would, would do. Um, so it may not. That's maybe that's why not. That's not why it was done with blocks because that's just the way yeah. they did things back then. But so you could do it by reconstructing that seawall, you know, to add some structural uh, support to be able to put fill on top of it. Um, to do that, you'd have to excavate a part of the road, which would cause some construction, you know, impacts to people's mm -hmm. uh, use of that road for some time. Um, the concrete wall, you know, I'm not sure if it could be done sort of uh, outboard of the existing stone block seawall, so they stay there if they're kind of built out. But with any, with any of these activities, we're trying to like minimize the risk of impacting the salt marsh that's there, so we're trying to use the strategy that has the lowest, the smallest footprint. So, um, and hopefully it minimizes some construction. So I think I think there's flexibility to look at those issues okay. more in design and really figure out the details, you know, really delineate the wetlands in there, really figure out what the geotechnical, what the bedrock, how low the bedrock is and what the best strategy would be. So we had to kind of approach it from a high level at this point. So is there any probability that when you do a, a rise like that, say it's 20, 30 ads or whatever, that it would meet its purpose of stopping water going there, but that that water would then might be diverted around the way to go around and put a flood in another neighborhood. Is that a concern at all when you design it? And, uh, uh, it's definitely a concern. It's a concern that, that people have. It's a concern that is um, vetted through the regulatory process. So when you want us to go get your permits from the state, they ask those questions on the permit. You know, they say, is this going to have any negative impacts on neighbors? And if you just say, no, 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 it's not, then they say, well, you know, show me the money, prove it. So, you know, part of the reason why we actually modeled these scenarios was to look at that. So we actually did kind of implement strategy two, the waterfront strategy, and we implemented the road strategy in this model, uh, in this hydrodynamic model, and we said, and we checked to see does it increase water levels. Um, for the water, so for the, um, for the road raising option, this one, it doesn't really. There's like no, it's less than inches, you know, of, of difference in water levels. Interestingly, depending on the type of storm, so in a tropical storm that we ran, uh, it had kind of the right water levels that we were trying to, um, to, to protect from right here in Cohasset Cove, but actually because it was a tropical storm, water levels were not as high in the Gulf. And in that scenario, water was coming through this flood pathway 
and then actually going out of Border Street into the Gulf, so rather out of Summer Street, over Summer Street in that little point by Black, Black Horse Lane. So when we cut this flood pathway, pathway off, it actually resulted in lower water levels in that area around Black Horse Lane. So there's some positive things that can happen too. Now, when we implemented this waterfront option, um, there were like up to a couple of inches of difference in some places, like a couple of inches. Um, in water levels. So there could be some really small impacts, but I don't think it, you know, at that point, a lot of things are really flooded. So another couple of inches might not really make a huge difference. Right where it says up on the B, on the water side of B, yeah. where you have the sheet piling in the earlier slide. Yeah. There's salt marsh there. Um, is there any feasibility in salt marsh restoration as a nature based solution or um, in your? Experiences study is it just not efficacious in the effort to restore salt marsh to create the result you're looking for? Um, well, so salt marsh, um, salt marsh itself does some good things for waterfronts, right? It holds soil together, right? So it can help reduce erosion. It can help. Um, slow down, take some of the wave energy out. Not like huge waves, right? Like not like a three foot wave. It's salt marsh is not gonna do anything with that. Uh, and if it's a really massive salt marsh, it can actually help to mitigate storm erosion. People talk about the salt marsh as like a sponge. That's true if it's like a really big marsh that you might have like on the coast of you know, North Carolina or in some places, the Great Marsh in you know, the North Shore. Um, here in these types of really small fringe marsh areas where you got you know, maybe 10 feet or something like that of salt marsh, doesn't really have that big of an impact. There's good reasons to want to protect and enhance the existing marsh that's there. One of the challenges that we're running into and the state's regulations are not really set up to deal with this is that like everybody wants more marsh, right? But when you build a marsh in a place that is something else, you lose that something else. And someone at some regulatory agency under some regulation or law wants to protect that something else. And so it's not always Sometimes when you want to build more, if you wanted to build more salt marsh, salt, salt marsh here, you might be in, in, impacting a rocky intertidal area, which is like habitat for fish, like juvenile fish eating the algae and stuff like that. Uh, so you know, now you've impacted this rocky intertidal area, and the fish, you know, permitters don't want to see that happen. So now you have to maybe build some other rocky intertidal somewhere else, and then you've maybe impacted some tidal flat, which might be shellfish habitat. So you know, it's a, unfortunately, like, it seems like rational, like, right, okay, we want more salt marsh because it does all these good things, but maybe it's not as simple as that. There's some trade off there, and it's not always simple from a permit perspective. So, sadly, sometimes we're pushed to just kind of do the thing that minimizes the bad things, the bad impacts to these salt marsh resources from our project, and maybe through another ecological restoration project where we're not trying to get something done, but we're just trying to, you know, Help this habitat survive. Maybe working cooperatively with the state and come up with things that they can support. It has to be somewhere like where there was marsh that kind of like is getting degraded, and then you're doing something to kind of shore up that marsh. Um, it's not clear that like, well, I mean, obviously this is all marsh, but like I showed a map previously from like 1980 or sorry, 1801 or something like that, and this was a road you know, going through here. So like, I'm not sure. How you would backtrack to say that there's a bunch of marsh that's that's right off there? Yes. Uh, a few years ago, when we had some flooding in Border Street, I seem to recall Border Street being flooded beyond where you're proposing to raise the road. Yes. So what's to prevent the water from simply going around and coming in from behind where you raise the road? <clears throat> um, uh, Border Street would flood uh, west, the east of here. Yeah. In this scenario. So we're, we're trying to stop all that water from going into the James Brook watershed, but we're, we're not solving all of the flooding on border. You say this is all high ground, ground. even from B going to the south is high ground that would prevent water from going in and around to. Uh, yeah. The so if I were to like pull back, like uh, on this graphic here, right? Like this, this is all high ground over here, right? So like, um, we're basically closing the gap between high ground over here at Margin Street and high ground over here on Border Street. 
and we're connecting those two high ground areas at a continuous level. So there is the only other place water could go is through the Gulf and then around the back door. And we'll be addressing that in upcoming slides, um, the different ways we would address that. But yeah, we don't, don't solve the flooding on Margin Street. We don't solve the problem on the rest of Lord Street with this strategy, with any of these strategies right now. And part of it, if we would, have, we would have proposed to do so had the situation with some of the waterfront, like the real waterfront properties not been so difficult to navigate. Uh, all right, jumping ahead here. How are we on time? Okay. We're good? Oh, look at that. It is 7 02. Okay, great. You guys sticking around? All right. All right, so <clears throat> our next strategy was looking at um, Summer Street. And on Summer Street, we, uh, like I mentioned previously, we said, well, can we take an incremental approach here? Is there something we can do that's kind of small scale in the near term that gets us some level of present day flood protection maybe uh, that you know doesn't have a bunch of impacts. And it's actually really challenging to do that. Um, we couldn't just like raise the road in this small section of, of Summer Street that's too low. Because when we raised, when we just tried to raise that road, what we saw was that those side slopes went into like people's houses, like halfway through their houses. Because the ground is continuing to go down away from um, even this low road. You know, as you go towards Jacob's Meadow. And so, you know, like we're hitting that. On the other side, we have salt marsh resources, we have some different wetland areas. So our side slopes going out that way would hit those wetland resources. So we're kind of like, okay, well, what else, how else could we solve this? So what we had to do was to kind of shift the road footprint over a little bit to the east and then um, use a combination of retaining like low, low sheet pile retaining walls on areas close to wetlands to avoid those wetland impacts. And then we could use the grassy side slopes to get down to the level of people's front yards without going way into their yards and impacting <laughs> the homes themselves. Um, so uh, this is uh, what the existing condition looks like and this is what this looks like. So uh, it's not visually very like impactful. Um, so it could be done. Uh, we lost the tree, I think. <laughs> um, but it doesn't get you that much flood protection, right? It gets you basically nine is kind of like, is basically the elevation of the seawall at the existing seawall between Elm Street and Porter Street. So there's still a risk of flooding, maybe in rare events, but it, it buys down a little bit of risk. Uh, the next strategy here was to kind of take that road raising uh, option and go from, you know, South Main Street as far as we could, um, down uh, Summer Street until we hit that point with the wet weather wetlands right close by. And there we have to go back to the sheet wall, or there we have to switch to a concrete wall. So we can't even raise the road up because the side slopes now, when we raise up, would go into people's yards on the west side, on the Jacobs Meadow side, and into their houses. So we had to just go with a the wall there. Um, and I'll show you kind of, we have a section AA that's right at that low point. BB that's closer to South Main, and then CC, which is at South Main itself. Uh, BB and CC don't really, um, are not that dramatic. So this is what we're talking about, the scale of uh, a wall in this <clears throat> AA section to avoid impacting the salt marsh and avoid impacting the private property. Um, this is our BB section, that's the existing, that's raising it to 11.8, not very dramatic. Uh, and this is CC on South Main Street. Again, not very dramatic. We're using the side slopes and the uh, sidewalks to basically meet that elevation. So um, everything except for that concrete wall is relatively <laughs> unimpactful. Now, I should jump back for a second. We are, uh, we have one condition, is it here? You can see there's, there's uh, we're tying into kind of, tying that wall into existing high ground at the, the northern driveway that you see at the very top of the, at the top of the graphic. There's another one where you see the deployable barrier to maintain access. There's another driveway that's like really narrow, hemmed in by wetlands on both sides. And so, you know, there's probably something you could do to maybe bring that driveway like up and then on, you know, over 
this elevation that's, I don't know, it's, it was really challenging to think about that. So we said, well, <coughs> for the meantime, 2050 design here, we could install a deployable barrier here. This is a barrier that would have to be put in place when a storm is coming, just like one of those tide gates I talked about earlier. On normal conditions, it would be open. People could drive right through that driveway during a storm. People should, I mean, if they're gonna leave, they could leave. They're actually, the house is on very high ground, so they could also stay if they wanted to. And then this deployable barrier would be closed during the future storm. Once waters recede, the deployable barrier would be open. Do you have a question? What about all the, uh, the the road breaks and the driveway breaks in that wall? Are, did they all get barriers as well, or are there? No. So those ones, the other ones are. Um, so do you mean on on sort of west, uh, west of Black Horse Lane? Uh, now I'm looking at uh, uh, Summer Street and then what side of that? Where there's the wall, but then there's breaks on the wall of Sandy Road and that, that. on the on this side. Uh, I was looking. Uh, no, down, down to lower to the left, where you, okay. yeah, th those those areas. Yeah, so this little stretch here is already high. It's already high enough. This little area, this small stretch here is basically already high enough. The driveways you can see here where it's a little bit elevated is like kind of a driveway regreen that you might even see, like we just redid our, we had our sidewalks redone in our neighborhood and some people's driveways got repaved. Okay. So, okay. Pre repaving. So it's just, you know, it's a, some kind of driveway stuff that would be done. Okay. Even under like a normal reconstruction project. Not terribly effective. But there are no other um, drives in this section. So we tried to minimize that by, by chasing this down here. So um, so this you know has some private property impacts, obviously. It's mostly kind of yards, driveways. There's that one access way, that one driveway there. Um, did I skip over this kind of summary slide? You can't read this. I've already presented a lot of information about these strategies. Um, I think the main thing to talk about is just, you know, like as I mentioned previously, the first strategy of raising the road just a little bit in that one section, you know, it can buy down some risk in the near term from a 20 year to a five year, or sorry, from a 20% chance to a 5% chance. That's a great improvement, um, but it's still not, you know, very sustainable in terms of like once you hit 2050, it's still flooding all the time. So this is the kind of recommended strategy if we're gonna go with this alignment here. And the cost we estimated to be like one to two million dollars approximately. Um, again, excluding a bunch of factors which could drive that off. Yes. So do I remember correctly that Summer Street is the area with the highest probability of vulnerability? Yeah, just that spot just um, north of Black Horse Lane. Yeah, just the Black Horse Lane. So part of it is the part that we raised and you didn't really notice that part's not as one of the least vulnerable section, but because it's all kind of one big section, we wanted to make it a continuous system that just, you know, we're gonna do something on Helm to border. We wanna do something on summer as well. And then you get a fully protected, you know, full system, right? A full um, protected system. Are there other, other questions on some of these options? I will keep just pounding you with more and more visuals. Good. All right, so now we're in area three. This is Westgate Lane. This is that private uh, road. So Black Horse Lane and Westgate Lane intersect. Black Horse Lane is public. Um, Westgate Lane is private. You've got kind of Westgate Lane going to uh, past this one property, 33056, uh, up to another property up there. And then this is kind of like a driveway also that goes up to another private property. Um, so, this is like, okay, can the town convince or work cooperatively or not cooperatively with prior property owners to do something that's kind of has a smaller area of intervention, has fewer people directly impacted, although those people are more impacted potentially, um, and, and then also have the benefit of protecting the stuff between here and Summer Street, right? In this Summer Street example that I was showing previously, there were a lot of properties on the like wet side of the barrier, right? Um, so those properties will be, you know, uh, protected if we're moving further towards the source of flooding. So in this first example, we're, uh, this is like a crazy example, you'll see, but this is like um, raising that, that section of road that again, here we're again, tightly packed in with uh, salt marsh resources on both sides of the road here. Um, 
So we have to kind of like narrow this road, which is already narrow a little bit, uh, raise it up on sheet piles. There's a culvert underneath it. We have to retrofit that with this hide gate and maybe upsize it, try to maybe improve the salt marsh resources. Um, uh, there's another tide gate over here, um, sorry, right here, connecting. This is kind of that place where that other flood pathway flanks off. Um, and then, so this gets raised, you know, you end up with like a, a high point in, in Black Horse Lane, you go here low and then you go up and you go back down. So this area of Black Horse Lane is not protected uh, from flooding and these driveways, and, uh, these houses are pretty high, but these driveways are not protected in this area. That's one option. The second option is we could just put a wall on the waterward side of Westgate Lane and then wrap down Black Horse Lane all the way to high ground down here. That's a really long wall and it, the cost estimates show it's quite expensive. Uh, a few extra, um, a few additional property owners, um, you know, have dry access and that, that means that it's emergency access to those those um, homes as well in, you know, an extreme way. Uh, some of this structure could be on private, pro uh, would be on private, pro a lot of it would be on private property, some of it could be on public property, but again, also a lot of um, impacts. And there's like a dock, you can see this dock structure here. So there are different ways to be able to pro continue providing that access. Uh, maybe with like a walkover structure, just like a something you, you walk up and down. Uh, Less, less desirable, but possible so there's a political barrier. And then we put like a third option because you'll see like the impact of raising that road so high is just kind of crazy. So we came up with this alternative solution um, where we raise the road a bit and also have this flood wall. Um, and we'll show you what those look like. So this is the existing condition at Westgate Lane. All right, my, my three uh, sections are one, kind of center of this road, the low point, the culvert, <clears throat> two, in front of this private property because they're like the most directly impacted, um, and C over here um, just to show what that wall might look like in this section. So here's A, and this is what raising the road looks like with the sheet pile, right? So it's like this kooky <laughs> situation, like not unheard of, but still weird. Um, and probably because it's sheet pile visually impactful. Now we had to do that because the salt marsh is so tight on the both sides. Um, that's one option. The second option was let's put this flood wall here. You can see the view is from the car if that matters to you a lot, um, is impacted. Um, and this is kind of like that intermediate, which in, in combines like this is a wall with a bit of a raised road. Our initial thought with, with this was that, you know, I was talking earlier about the tide gates and how if they're manual tide gates just for storms, then water could be coming under them just from high tides. And so we wanted to like raise the road a little bit to like mitigate some of that high tide flooding. But you know, in further discussion, we, we think that the tide gates can be designed in a way that you don't have to, um, they can either be, let's say, either automated or designed such that this is not, that, that, that it's not allowing so much water up through it to flood the yards, right? To flood, to flood the road, for example. So I don't love this option, but it's visually somehow less weird than this one, right? <laughs> um, and this is uh, in front of that um, home. Um, this is the first option of raising the road. This is the second option of the wall. And this is the third that's kind of combined of the two. So, uh, not as bad as um, one might expect. Uh, and then um, section C, which is on Black Horse Lane, this is what the existing condition looks like. Uh, this is with the flood wall, and that's the same for the last two options. So um, comparing these strategies, they have, they're the same level of you know protection. Um, the daily tidal flooding vulnerability depends on the tide gate design, but it could be N, A, N, A, N, A. They're designed smartly, which hopefully one would do. Um, that could add a little bit to the cost, but um, CBD, how much? Um, 
if you raise the adapt in terms of their adaptability in the future, like if you raise that road to 11.8, like are you going to raise it another two feet in the air? Probably not. Um, so we have that as kind of a low adaptability. The walls you can raise them, you can raise the road next to them to you know reduce that visual wall scale um, for people on the road or walking. So we have those as, as we need. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of private property impacts. Like most of this stuff is happening on private property in these examples. Cost ranges from uh, a, a uh, in the kind of in the one and a half to four and a half. Right? The, the cost estimates here were kind of all over the place, depending on which sources of data we were using. So it's sort of like counterintuitive. We have, you know, two million. We have kind of like on the low end, this is the most expensive one, but on the high end, this is the most expensive one. So I think a reasonable person would say it's somewhere in like the one and a half to four and a half million dollars to do any of these strategies. Um, but probably the road raise option is maybe a little bit uh, somewhere in the middle. Let's say. All right. Any comments or questions on the Westgate main options? Three different kinds of strategies here. I guess just to clarify, if if this options were pursued, then you don't need to do the summer street options. That's correct. Is instead of that. assuming that the tide gates are designed to deal with the tidal flooding in the long run. In 2050, we don't have daily tidal flooding, you know, um, generally around this area. So um, yeah, it would be a first option. But, you know, if it's like a manual tide gate in 2050, you're probably closing that thing like so often, right? Because even the smallest one can have impacts. So, you know, it becomes like, you really do need something that's more sustainable from an operational perspective. So. Great minds to solve that in the future, but it's a problem that has solutions. Let's say. Yes. I have a general question about if you did do this kind of work, both of those Westgate Lane paths that you said, those are actually private driveways, so they're probably paper roads. They're both private drivers to single family. Are you creating a conflict? Are they absorbing any cost? Or is it town and the state and federal government's cost? That's why we started out just trying to do <laughs> things on the solution public land. Okay. Um, there are different solutions that, you know, and it really depends on each individual property. Like you have to work with them, right? So in, I, I'm saying that from the town's perspective, not, not to speak for the town, but putting myself in the shoes of a municipal worker. You know, how do you how do you manage that? Um, there are places where private property owners are all too happy to sign an easement. You know, giving the town operations and maintenance you know rights to uh, be able to then for the town or for the community to then be able to pursue some kind of grant, federal, state, whatever it may be, grant to implement that project, and then thereafter to be able to take care of it as needed. So. You know, that driveway could be a headache for people. Sometimes those easements come with like, well, um, you can't exclude the public from that driveway. So maybe you had a gate and now you have to get rid of that gate. So sometimes that's like too much of a thing. Sometimes people don't trust that, you know, government is going to take care of the stuff that they build. So they say, well, I'd rather do it myself. You know, so it's kind of, it really depends on the perspectives of, of each individual property owner. And then, of course, like, um, Municipalities have eminent domain rights, right? Like they have scenarios in which they can say there's a proper public purpose here, flood control, they absolutely must have this. But nobody wants to use that power, right? Like <clears throat> Americans, we love private property rights, and like no town official wants to have that, you know, thorn in their side. So um, it's not the easiest thing to, to deal with, but if you have like people that want to play all together, then there are ways to solve it with simple arrangements or more, you know, they could turn over the, they could sell that parcel to the town or there could be easement or, you know, there's different ways of solving it. Generally, though, it's hard to spend public money on a private property and not 
get those access to maintain and operate threads. So that's hard to do. I don't know where you do that. Yes. Just for the sake of discussion, anticipating that uh, Gulf River that you qualified by saying the, the massive tide gate would be a massive undertaking. The town owns or the state owns the bridge. That would be an easier scenario, but it would be so much costlier. So I'm not really asking a question as much as saying the cost benefit of doing something by eminent domain, um, in which to George's point, you'd be um, eliminating the need for other interventions. It would seem like um, the argument for eminent domain would be enhanced public good versus these other options. And maybe it wouldn't even get to that. Right, like I haven't talked to any of these property owners, and to my knowledge, the project team hasn't. So, you know, maybe there's something less than a domain that could solve that. Um, so, you know, it is one of the tools. It's, it's not enjoyed to be used, you know, by at least especially by local government. Um, so, thank you for sharing that. All right. So the last section, my my title is blocking one of the crosses. That's A A. Um, in this section, we have kind of these three uh, passageways for water. There's two kind of small culverts under um, Border Street. One in this area, on Government Island, that goes out. You know, I think the coastal schools out here, and then um, this one that's across from the Lobster Island kind of area over here, and of course the main. Um, channel under the bridge. And um, so here we're showing a concrete wall that's connecting to high ground on both sides of this channel and a high gate on the culvert opening. Um, so in this scenario, like Border Street would still flood section, but that flooding would not emanate up the wall. Um, in this middle section where you know, there's a there's a project in uh, the Herring River up on the Cape. They just got like $62 million in, or they got like $50 million in grants for a $62 million project that's going to restore the Herring River by removing a big dike that's going across the river, um, replacing it with a bridge with some <coughs> sort of her, you know dam sections and then some really large high gates. And they're going to open those tide gates slowly to kind of test the waters and adaptively manage how much tidal flow they have to the, to the watershed. And they're going to restore like hundreds of acres of salt marsh, right? So um, that that structure that they're designing there is like uh, 195 feet wide. Um, this is a different scenario, but that gap, that opening there is something like 85. So it's like almost like half half the width. Um, so you can put that $62 million in perspective and uh, we had independently used a different methodology to estimate what the cost of this thing would be. Basically, you know, some, some wing walls on both sides of the, the bridge and then between them really large tide structures that either open, probably, not, probably open up and down. Um, and they can also be designed to allow um, the normal tidal flows, but not more than those. So it could help to, to mitigate some of the impacts of sea level rise, not just on people, but also <laughs> on the marsh system, right? Because the marshes, when they're, they can get drowned out by, by the rising tide, right? So as sea level rises, a lot of the low marsh that we have in Massachusetts is predicted to transition to mudflats. Um, so this could help to maybe uh, mitigate that. However, caveat, <laughs> like, Tons of analysis, tons of regulatory, uh, uh, not negotiation, cooperation, I don't know, would need to go into anything like this, right? Like you're talking about changing how much water comes into a massive system with a ton of sensitive environmental resources that exist today, right? You don't want to hurt the thing that's there today. Um, so you'd have to do a lot of work to show that what you were going to do here would not have a negative impact on all these resources. Um, takes, you know, like in the Herring River example, different scenario, but that, that's been like in the works for like a decade. 
Yeah. More than one. Yeah. Almost yeah. two. Almost two decades. So long term, um, <clears throat> just to get people on the same page about this. Uh, yes. Same question that wing wall that you envision does it still allow boat navigation to go up and down the Gulf River? Yeah, I think um, it could be as you know as small as kind of structurally needed to be able to support the the drop the drop the yeah the gates. Um, I don't know when that bridge is like next. Do you know how, anybody know how recently it was replaced? The original bridge is 1926. Original bridge is 1926. I don't know how much. It's so it's young for Massachusetts Bridge. <laughs> um, actually, <laughs> I think parts of it just been restored to um, in the past year to, okay. to make it more resilient. We envision this structure being, I mean, it could actually help protect the bridge. So we envision it being on the waterward side of the bridge so you can kind of like separate those two lives from each other. Like Mass DOT doesn't want a bunch of like pedal control structures <laughs> to, to operate and maintain for perpetuity. So um, it's uh, it's um, technically feasible, you know, regulatorily questionable, um, and financially expensive, but um, it, it should, theoretically should work. Um, okay, so this is showing. Uh, I don't actually have a cross section of what that gate looks like because I was too afraid to put it on paper. Um, <laughs> this is that existing section of Border Street kind of close to the Lobster Town. That's the wall that one would see on the landward side. Not too different from sort of like the rocky outcroppings you would see in that section anyways. Um, there is, you need to do that, some of that work on private property again, um, but not like in people's houses or even affecting their driveways. This is on the other side, closer to the, that marsh system that leads out to the coastal school. Um, and in this case, we can raise the road in this section and um, not need to install like a wall. So there's no um, private property and uh, homes and driveways are not like packed in there. So there's enough space to be able to do it without um, having those kinds of impacts. So we put the cost range at like 15 to 40 million dollars. And if we do that simple like scaling down of the Herring, <laughs> the Herring River example it was somewhere like 30. So I was like, oh, hey, it worked. Um, what we originally used to estimate this was a, a tool that the Army Corps of Engineers used. They did a big study. They're doing a lot of these studies all over the place now um, of like intercoastal waterways like in New Jersey or in Florida. <clears throat> and um, you've got like these big barrier islands in New Jersey. And like, of course, everybody wants like a storm surge barrier, right? I, people in Tallahassee want a storm surge barrier too. I've heard it in these meetings. <laughs> now you want a one across from where the breakwater is, just go from Bassings Beach to the other side and create a big storm surge barrier. So those are um, very, that's that would be, problems. yes. Right. Well, they almost everything just built, right? Except that Bassings Beach is not high enough to prevent water from going around it. So you'd have to do something mm -hmm. along Massing's Beach too and chase that tail as long as it goes. And you can't put anything like hard, like a seawall or like a, so you'd have to rely on more nature-based solutions, which could be prone to erosion and things like that or require maintenance. And the town of Cohasset doesn't own that property. And so it's like a whole bunch of challenges with that, let alone the actual structure, putting something like that in the harbor from a regulatory standpoint, where you might have seagrass or you might have other resource areas out there. Um, so that we didn't even look at that. You know, we considered it, but we thought it was a little bit um, unrealistic for things the town could do in the near term, or at least get started with the planning design for. So we didn't do that. Um, we did. It's not shown here. We we are evaluating uh, raising the breakwater. So that's out there. There's existing breakwater. Uh, this has been brought up in a couple of different places, but that would be really helpful. Um, we are still evaluating it. So um, we did run like uh, one storm scenario and it didn't look like it had a big, like the area where it would reduce wave heights. It's like those kind of breakwaters, they're just cutting down waves. That's their purpose. They're not stopping the storm surge. That's flooding 
in all these areas. They're just cutting down leaves, which could be helpful for even the salt marsh, the fringe salt marsh, right? Like it's less impacted by waves, maybe it's eroding less. It, it's beneficial for maybe you don't have to build the seawall as high if, if the waves are lower. Um, um, and the other waterfront properties that are not protected by, by the strategies we're talking about today. Uh, but it looked like from that first test case, and we're going to do several more because we want to really tease this out a little bit better, um, that the area of benefit, meaning the area in which wave heights would be mitigated, was kind of small. So we're going to continue to look at it, and uh, it's probably likely to have some benefits somewhere, but it may not be worth the cost of, of doing it. So, but we'll, we're keeping an open mind and I'm going to keep testing it out to see if that helps. Any other questions on this option? So sorry to all, anybody who's on the line that's been waiting for me to answer their questions. Maybe we answered them. Um, okay, so, so preface. So um, I mentioned that we modeled these strategies in the MCFRM tool, right? So we have this data database of these thousands of different storms. We went through it and looked, okay, you know, which of those storms come close to our 11.8 number, which is 11.8 or 12 number is based on a probabilistic analysis of all these storms, right? So it's not one particular storm. So we try to find the storms that closely match it in terms of regional variety. We found a tropical storm that was like, again, reached the right water levels we're looking for right in Cohasset Harbor, but didn't push enough water into the Gulf to activate what should be like the more concerning flood pathway over Summer Street. Uh, and then we found another, uh, we found a nor'easter that was that reached 12.12, .12, which is above our 11.8. And it kind of did what you would expect it to do, what the 11.8 should do. So we kind of like looked at these two different scenarios. We ran um, all of them, we ran all these strategies with the tropical storm scenario. We ran some of them with the extra tropical storm scenario, but we changed our design flood elevation in that case from 11.8 to 12.8. Two or twelve point three. So we basically said, you know, let's test this thing, the system out. If we block these flood pathways up to our design levels in the locations where we did it, does it create any negative um, externalities for people on the wrong side of that barrier? Does it close the gaps? Does it close all the gaps, or is there something else that we're missing? And what we found was that they do work. So, um, right. So they they that's that's how engineering should work, right? They should work. So. What we did was to consider, um, kind of summarize like what, what's protected at what cost under a couple different scenarios. So the first one, oh, the colors are, can you see those colors? I can't really come in. Where's my little, you got to come here. Laser. All right. So um, this this um, area here is supposed to be kind of like a yellowish color. It looks completely white on the screen here. So this area here is the area that would be protected uh, if we did the L raising the road on um, between Elm Street or between Margin Street and Border Street. Talked about that, and then. Doing raising Border Street with the raised roadway and the wall through this section here. So that protects 3.5 miles, which are 16% of the um, roads that are flooded town wide in the same in the same at the same 1% level in 2050. Um, and 188 buildings, which is like a third of the buildings that are vulnerable in this storm wind. So just that alone, that first strategy um, is quite impactful uh, at a you know two to four million dollar cost. Um, it protects all 10 of the kind of critical assets that we identified in this area, including the wastewater treatment plant and all those assets that we showed as being really vulnerable in this scenario. Um, all these roadways that are highlighted shown here, uh, the MBTA commuter rail, um, the businesses you know down here, the Red Lion Inn, the St. Anthony's, the post office, like all these assets, the uh, Smith Place Pump Station. So um, very impactful, positively. 
uh, it does it in that nor'easter. It doesn't change the water levels. Um, it doesn't worsen water levels back here or in the cove. In the tropical storm, actually, by blocking this flood pathway, so in the tropical storm, water is coming out like this. So actually, the water levels here were actually lower from, from the strategy and not higher. So there, there's a potential positive, there's a potential upside in some kinds of events and uh, not really any downside in, in, the, in um, other kinds of events. So the other strategy, which would basically be that Westgate lane combined with the road raising through here, sort of, sort of combines benefits in this green zone and this uh, yellow zone. So that adds up to uh, 3.8 miles. So there's a marginal increase in, in roadway benefits. 213, so much more properties there. The ones that are between, you know, this, this is a section on Black Horse Lane on the, the other side of um, Summer Street for kind of a three, three to $5 million range. Slightly more expensive, but you get more benefits. Um, you have kind of uh, the wall version of this where we're coming down uh, Black Horse Lane. So there's a really, really, um, there's that extra set stretch of Black Horse Lane, so 3.9 miles, one extra building. So basically there's no difference in the buildings, but more like access benefits. Um, and potentially a higher cost. So this is a weird, again, that weird one. We had kind of like a range of about two to six million dollars. Um, and then the last one, uh, this is the waterfront, where we take the waterfront approach between margin and border and uh, deal with the gulf crossings here. And <clears throat> that case, again, is a very high cost. So there's 15 million for the gates. So everything else is kind of like small, whatever, jump change, but yes, yeah, like 17 to 42 million. 6.6 um, .6 miles, so a third of the, the roads that were vulnerable in this event in town, across the whole town are mitigated in this case. <clears throat> Almost like half the buildings that are potentially vulnerable mitigated as well. So high cost. Um, the cost is like 10 times higher and the benefits are you know, like twice as high, approximately a little bit less than that or so. So there's like this, you know, is it worth it? Maybe um, to really analyze like the cost effectiveness of this, you can do something called the benefit cost analysis. And you can use tools that FEMA uses when they're evaluating different projects, the Army Corps uses when they're evaluating different projects. Um, and you then consider like what level of damage to all these different buildings and what would the impact be from all these roadways flooding. I aggregate those economic impacts, compare that with a more detailed cost estimate potentially or maybe a similar level of cost estimating. And then you compare those costs versus the benefits. And if the benefits outweigh the costs, then it's cost effective. That's you know green signal for this as a project that you can afford. And that's true for really all these cases. I, I find it hard to imagine that you know some of the some of these strategies would not be cost effective. But um, again, these costs might be missing some some, some factors. So this is kind of like from the definitely missing a, a couple of pieces. Um, we had presented to the sewer commission some recommended strategies. Um, we recommended some strategies for 2030. So like some things they could do in the near term, like um, you know, Margin Street is going to be repaved and there are a bunch of vulnerable sewer manholes on Margin Street. Well, when the town repaved or redid Border Street, they replaced those manholes with water type manholes. So that when Border Street floods, all that salt water is not going into the treatment plant and damaging the process. So when they do Margin Street, they could do the same thing, right? When um, all those manholes that are in, in Jacob's Meadow, those are like the last places that sewage is going before it gets to the plant. So if a bunch of salt water is coming in there, not only is it potentially causing backups, but it's also really directly injecting a lot of salt water into the treatment process, again, which could really damage the system. So we recommended like, you know, try to tackle some of those high priority, high vulnerability uh, sewer manholes, not like the coolest thing in the world, yeah. but 
practical. <laughs> uh, consider maybe raising like the access road to the treatment plant because it's on it's pretty low. And in any of these scenarios where water is going over Summer Street, chances are that treatment plant is cut off from the from Elm Street, and so people are either stuck there or can't get there, or they can maybe on a boat or something like that. Um, so we had some some near term re recommendations, but then we had this these long term recommendations, which had like a bunch of more panels. And this was really done from like a perspective of like you know blinders, just focusing on the wastewater treatment yeah. system. And you can see that like trying to address each you know each sector or each system's um, uh, vulnerabilities on like an asset by asset approach adds up. So some of these costs, like to build a perimeter flood wall around the the treatment plant have like a similar cost to some of the regional strategies we were talking about in this whole presentation. So like, why would you spend that money just protecting the treatment plant when you could protect like a whole area, including by the way, like the houses that you're sewering, right? So we have these options here, like, you know, all else fails and you really need to keep the system going. You know, you've got some strategies and some costs to work with. If you're gonna do big retrofits to the system anyways, consider doing things to you know, make it less vulnerable for unexpected events that might happen between now and hopefully someday, not too far off. Um, and so that's kind of what my perspective on this is like, there are some things that can be done from the wastewater treatment, from the wastewater system side in the near term. And then there are things that should be, you know, start planning and doing a little more detailed analysis on from the regional perspective. We're having a public meeting today to just share these for the first time with the community and you know nothing like this just comes to be the, the next year right like there's a lot of um people that need to agree that something needs to get done and ask for things to be done there's a lot of electeds who need to like weigh the costs of doing this try to figure out how do you fund this how does it compare with other priorities um there are grant programs out there and we this project is supported by coastal zone management um hopefully you know the next phase of this project whether it's going out and replacing those sewer manholes themselves, right? Like something on the ground real, or it's designing, you know, a higher level of design for one of these to really understand how to minimize private property impacts of raising the road or something like that. Um, you know, it's possible that those could be successful grant applications. Um, not to speak for CZM, but, but I know that they like to see things from the vulnerability and planning kind of stage through to implementation so they can say, hey, look, we have, make this community more resilient, right? That's their goal. They want to help um, the Commonwealth. So um, it's also not the only grant game in town. There are other grants that the town could pursue, you know, to kind of take a next step and, and look at these things. The town could also use its own resources if you want to understand how cost effective are these, these strategies, you know, to inform a grant application to FEMA. Well, like that money's got to come from somewhere to do that kind of analysis. We don't do it ourselves. We have other people that do it. And so that's something that the town could do on its own. So um, we think the good news is that there are there are a set of strategies we think are technically feasible that have some impacts, but they're kind of shared for the most part impacts, some minor impacts to people's um, property potentially, but um, we're not like bulldozing the neighborhood or something like that to save some other neighborhood, right? So that's good. Yes. Uh, on the funding, I just wanted to mention uh, a bill that was introduced into the state house so recently. There was a, um, a um, uh, hearing on it last week. It's called uh, an act establishing a climate change super fund and promoting polluter responsibility or in shorter form, make polluters pay bill. And this is modeled after the 1980 super fund uh, act from the federal government that uh, has been very successful over the Succeeding decades and providing funds for remediating a lot of toxic waste sites. So this is to ask the um, require the major polluters uh, who put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere to contribute to a fund that would would be then distributed to towns around Massachusetts to uh, pay for these resiliency projects. Um, and uh, the estimates are that it could provide uh, it vary. The estimates vary, but uh, at the low low end of the scale, ten billion dollars over a period of years, and potentially several times that amount. So I'm mentioning this law because uh, it's just been introduced, and 
it could be good for uh, Cohasset and other towns in Massachusetts as a source of funds. So it might be worthwhile, um, you know, talking to our our legislators and, and encouraging them to support the bill. Yeah, there are, um, we're lucky to live in Massachusetts. I had this one re recurring dream where like everybody is trying to get into Massachusetts, like when the climate is really bad, makes be prepared and other communities and other places didn't. Um, it's not, it's not cool. And you woke up. Yeah, that woke up. Uh, but that's that's what's great about living here is that you know we are on, on top of these issues and our legislators are thinking about it. Um, you know, last environmental bond bill that the state passed had a lot of funding that has gone into these programs. Um, there are calls. There's advocacy ongoing for other bills that would provide like 100 million dollars a year through the MVP program, which is another uh, grant program the state that has that the town has participated in is eligible for. Um, so yeah, we're going to spend money on this one way or the other. Uh, money gets more expensive over time, they say. So good to start at least planning for things and um, getting your hands around the scale of the problem and the solutions, which is what we're here for. So that's uh, my presentation. We have some next steps. We're going to um, circulate to people who were invited to this on the town website and um, people who may have attended previous meetings, it's an online survey, write some a range of questions about I don't know how helpful was this information uh, about the vulnerabilities here, um, you know what your thoughts are about these strategies. Uh, we're not asking you to like vote to decide which one's going to happen. That's not in any of our individual hands, but. Um, Try to understand a little bit better what people's concerns are about these different strategies and what kind of things they would support uh, and their level of sort of support, support and urgency for the town to take action on this so it can help to guide um, some of the towns thinking about next steps. Um, I think the town is planning to, but we have some reporting to complete by the end of the fiscal year. I'll have Jason up, thank you. Uh, June 30th is my deadline. Um, and at the same time, well, actually, just, just later, I think July 10th or 11th, the Next year's grants are due. Your applications for next year's grants are due. So the town is um, we're planning to work with the town to put together a grant to do something next. Um, I don't know exactly what yet, but probably something. Maybe one of those. Maybe maybe there's two, or maybe there's one with the, between the wastewater work and some of these uh, regional strategies. When are those grants due? Did you repeat that? The grant applications are due. I think July 11th. In, in three weeks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, depends on the department, but it could be a combination of planning and DPW, typically with like, you know, blessings from the That's how it usually works. Maybe Mass has got a grant application for 100 pages or more. No, there's a page limit. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a crazy time of year. But you know, at least we have that extra week in July. Usually this happens, usually these grant applications are, I don't know how this, I don't know how it worked, it was intentional, but usually the grant applications like come out in April and they're due in May. And at that time, we're just kind of like figuring out like the results and what they need and what to do next. And we've got to somehow come up with a grant application for next year. So like, at least in this case, we kind of know what the results are and have had some conversations about it before we wrap things up, which is always like a, a mad dash. So mm -hmm. that's from the consultant side of, of things. Comments? I don't want to. I would agree with all of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, are we going to address any of the chat questions in the Zoom? Oh, good point. Our last point is just that we're continuing to work on the, I think over the summer we'll finish the integrated flood model and hopefully have some new results to share with folks. Is there we have any questions in the chat? So I think we are good to continue any conversations here. Okay. Thank you. We'll go through everyone on YouTube. <clears throat>
Um, so yeah, that's the end of uh, the presentation. But uh, any final thoughts, questions? No, yeah. this is class. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you for joining to those online and virtually. And everybody who came in person, thank you for your engagement questions. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. All right.